Today's proud sponsor of episode 102 is Suburban Riot. Go to SuburbanRiot.com and go look at their hoodies, t-shirts, and other paraphernalia. Go look at their Always Sunny in Philadelphia collection, as well as their favorite daughter tees and their famous kale tee. At checkout, enter the code MCOMBINE2020 and get an extra 25% off for the first 20 customers. SuburbanRiot.com, proud sponsor of the Combine. Today's episode, man, pretty amazing. We got coming up yeah. DJ Lynch and Rob McIntyre. Um, their credits include SpongeBob SquarePants, Animaniacs, um, dude, countless amount of shows. I've they had do the Fast episode. and the Furious, but, yeah, uh, Fast and Furious. The yeah, they're currently doing the Fast and Furious cartoon. They're doing Jurassic Crustacean, Crustacean Camp, Camp Crustacean. Right. Um, and it's a real honor to have them on here because these guys are so busy. They just recently started Rebel Sound. Um, their studio here in Burbank, California, and they're continuing to expand as business owners and stuff like that. And they just have a good, solid, de over decade of experience of coming from nothing to something, uh, from starting yeah. off as an intern to being, to being, to being the business professional and business owner, and, and how they balance it. So here we go, episode one hundred and two. And you know, there was a lot of there was a lot of upsides and downsides, and a lot of good things and. You know, we had some fun at times. There were some other frustrating things, but I think it's, you know, it's like how it is at any, at any, at any place of business, any work, any, you know. Yeah. You know. Just with a little more hazing. Yeah. Yeah. Resource, uh, human resources and uh, ethnic cults, you know, standards go out the window a little bit and you can, you, know, you have to be okay with that. You just have to be okay with that. You know, it sometimes happens. <laughs> Mike, Mike, and I were the, Mike and I were the people that said, you know, that were the ones that said everything that everybody else was thinking, but we actually said it out loud. Mike, some more so than I, than me. But hey, man, you can't you can't put cancer on a bandit a bandit on cancer. You know, that's my favorite one. Uh, it's uh, yeah, that's, that's when true. I was at the end of my rope. Um, yeah, good times, good times. But uh, good to cool. have you guys here. Welcome to the music combine. Yeah, Thank man. You. Thank you. Man. O two, um, so tell me, you know, guys have been what? I mean, pandemic. I mean, post. I mean, technically, you guys work in a lot of the animated realm of things. Do you guys find that you're still just as busy because shows really haven't stopped? Because outside of probably doing VOs and things of that nature, or is it, or is it full steam ahead? Pretty much at Rebel at Rebel Sound. It's it's interesting. It's interesting that it's it's probably just as busy in some in some cases. We're actually not doing as many episodes of shows as the schedules have as have spread out over the course of you know weeks, but it keeps us just as busy because it takes longer to complete an episode, a review, because there's so much back and forth because the clients aren't able to be in the room talking to us. Sure. So, whereas a mix mm -hmm. like a day essentially before. It can last like three, four, five days, depending on how long it takes to get feedback. Same wow. thing with reviews and whatnot. So, you know, we're you know, we, we initially we tried to curtail that, and then when we realized that like, it just wasn't possible, we just were like, okay, we have to roll with it. So, I think we're just as busy, just not uh, doing as much, you know, volume. Sure, 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 sure. Quality I mean, over quantity. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you hit on it. You know, we're our primary bread and butter work is, is animation is, is sound for, for television animation and a little bit for direct to video. Um, and I mean, one thing I think we, you know, the, everybody, at least in the television and film business has learned over, you know, the years is that, you know, TV is pretty much recession proof. I mean, everything, we you know, when things are bad, everybody stays home and watches television. Yeah, It's obviously. almost, it's almost the first thing they buy is entertainment, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, Netflix, Netflix goes up, all the streaming services are doing great, you know, 
And, uh, and then on top of that, like animation, even more so only because a lot of this stuff, like, like, as we're seeing now, it doesn't require a hundred people to be all together on a sound stage or on a set. Um, most people do have the ability to work from home. A lot of the work mm -hmm. was done months and months and months ago. So it's already in the pipeline. Um, really the only sort of hiccups we've had is, is that, yeah, like when everybody switched to working from home, there was some hiccups in that the studios had to sort of you know, stop down for a moment to, you know, sort of retool to get that working. Mm. And then, uh, yeah. so, so the schedules, they did kind of postpone some things, but now we're kind of feeling like it's, it's starting to get back on track. But then, yeah, the other big thing is just voiceover and ADR. Like usually right before we, we finish a mix, uh, or right before we're about to do a mix, uh, that's when they send the actors back into the studio, ideally to do last minute pickup lines and change any, you know, performance or technical issues. And, they haven't been able to do that. So it's like, we've been doing a lot of like evaluating, you know, home ADR setups and listening to people like recording in their walk-in closet. And <laughs> it's probably, probably what, was, what was used for an audition is now used for a professional used. use. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm so yeah. going to get this voiceover audition. I swear. Let me go in my closet with my blue mic. You know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like the, the, the person's nervous about the, what they have to do. And they're like, they bring you into their closet. Like, uh, so welcome. Uh, let's, let's get it going. <laughs> you have yeah. to evaluate. It's like, here's your test. Here's your test. Um, you set up your sound booth the way you think is right. And if you get close to the way it needs to be, then we'll, we'll just go ahead with that. But, uh, yeah, so you guys have to like calibrate and work with people on their setups virtually, make sure they're set up. But once they're set up, I mean, it should start being a little faster, right? Yeah. I mean, we're already, you know, at first it was a little shaky. You were getting people who you could tell they were basically like sitting at their kitchen table with their laptop and, you know, it just, it sounded like they were in their kitchen, you know, and, right. So, you know, and, and of course, you know, some of the more, you know, quote unquote professional, you know, or people who do the voiceover for animation thing, like as a, as a regular, every job, you know, most of them already have, you know, their own recording boots. They've already got their own sort of, you know, decent setup. So it was, you know, their, their, their material that we were getting in was sounding pretty good, but just in the last couple of weeks, like you can tell that the casting departments and the recording people are, you know, in addition to us are giving them all feedback and they're trying to really dial in their, their setup. So we're already seeing a huge improvement. And I think we've already mixed a couple of episodes of things that have included some of that, you know, at home ADR, which, you know, it, it maybe requires a little bit of, you know, a little bit more, you know, mixing or engineering on my part, but it's mm -hmm. ultimately, it's all going to sound it's all going to sound pretty good. It's all going to work. The, so. the interesting part's going to be, you know, because animation typically is so far ahead of what they're delivering, you know, a lot of our shows, a lot of shows in general do a cast record with their actors up front and then they go back in at the end and pick up lines, which is what we've been doing. So I'm actually interested to see, you know, six months from now, you know, to see if, if they're actually going to attempt to record entire casts remotely or if they're wow. just trying to pull it out so they can get everybody back. Um, I think that's where it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, what happens with animation because of, just because of the schedule being so far ahead of it. It, it really <laughs> amazes me. Like, you know, you hear a new company every day, either going out of business or keeping workers at home to work from home. And, you know, to hear that to me and my, you know, ultimate purest production mind would say, well, how the, how the F are you going to do that? I mean, you know, you need the booth, you need, to shoot ADR with two mics, you need to do all these things that are proper for that. You know, is that going to be the new standard? It's kind of like the Napster versus the record store or, you know, well, you know what I mean? Well, it's interesting because, you know, in an effort to stay, yeah. in an effort to stay in business and keep the, the, you know, the wheel turning, you know, a lot of uh, studios that do recording, I know have been helping some of the actors get set up at home so that they oh, can, wow. You know, which, you know, which is good because, you know, th that's, that would that's be, that'd true. be a great, that would be a great service actually. If you could do right. like hello fresh with a microphone and a converter to your, computer, but, but at the same you know. token, like, but hello in, audio in the, in the now it's definitely, <laughs> uh, in the now it's definitely a good business, but what does that do to set up? Awesome. Does that cut you, does that cut the middleman out down the road? Like you're saying, sure. like when, once you get everybody set up at home, do, do the studios turn around and go, well, you know, we can just have them, you know, go directly and we don't need to have them bring it into a studio. So how's yeah. that going to change? Well, yeah. How's, how's their consciousness now with, with that, with that adjustment? Like, 
you know, they're doing it. You guys are all hands on. Everybody's doing everything they can to get that going. But at the end of the day, um, you're, you're working in the moment, right? So, so then as soon as everything's done, you know, let's see when this fucking ship blows over, they're going to, you know, are they saving money by not booking more studio time with these people? You know, the capacity aspect of like filling that time in slots and you have all that kind of all that real estate for them to come in and do it where you are at the studio or are they going to make more money with them leaving them at home? It's probably going to be an incremental thing, right? So it's going to be like, okay, so people come back to work incrementally, make sure that they're not, you know, stepping on anybody's toes and and then they'll probably it will probably go back to normal. But at the same point, people um, that are having these studio setups, they'll get so much more work done as well. So it's, it's probably going to be a mix of both. And I, I'm not a North Thomas or anything, but with, you can kind of see what they're doing with work stuff. Like they're telling everybody to stay home and incrementally come back. And then over by me, I don't know about you. No, but it's not, nothing's really the same right now. Everything's just totally different. So you go anywhere outside of where you are it's well I, completely I, think, different. I think especially after this weekend it's been uh, part of my french fucking nuts in la it's, <laughs> it's not mean, safe yeah well it's not only not safe but the thing is is like we're kind of coming out of a pandemic kind of and i mean i don't even think kind of i think just the riots are distracting everybody from from what's really going on and Sure, it's part of you it. know, not to get too political, but like I, I feel like you know that putting it away, you know, people working from home might be a thing again. But also, let's kind of talk about and shift topics real quick because I don't yeah. want to get on that downer bullshit. <laughs> um, but let's talk about you know Rebel Sound. You guys, after the ten years I've known you both collectively, um, decided to break out on your guys' own. Uh, which, by the way, congratulations, DJ. I haven't told you because I haven't seen you. But uh, thank you. <laughs> but but also, um, you know, I you know, I told Rob this over the phone maybe months ago. I said there's not two finer people who should not be together than you guys. And you know, running a business. No, I mean it's it, when you find two personalities that click really well together and have a very like common interest and like common goal. I I don't see that there's a lot of friction between you guys. You guys really kind of work together each other. job job done and the smirk says it all rob but that's okay um <laughs> well thank you it's funny because uh rob actually mentioned we were having lunch last week just sitting here and, and uh, he was like just out of the blue he's like you know we seem to argue a lot less now <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a bonus right it's, it's so funny. I wonder. I wonder what the common denominating factor was in that one <laughs> well yeah i mean the thing is is like you know we you know just you know I, I've been with working with him for, you know, over a decade now. And yeah. it's like, we're, we're essentially tied at the hip, almost like brothers. Now we are essentially through the business. And, you know, obviously we'd have our, we'd have our moments with each other, like coming up, but like, it's almost like now that we've been in business together. Yeah. There's just this mutual respect that like we, we hardly ever get frustrated with each other. It's just like, what do you think of this? What do I think of that? And everything like that. And so without having that middle management and other people involved, it's like, we just, we just sort of go about and make our decisions and, you know, and, and I mean, it, it's like you guys came, came firing with both guns loaded, you know, when you guys started this, I mean, let's talk about some of the shows you guys are working on Jurassic park for Warner brothers, not the movie, the show, right. The for animated. Dream, yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah. For DreamWorks and universal. Yeah. 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 And I mean, one of my favorites because I have several of the cells hanging up in my house uh, is animaniacs. I mean, that's, that's huge Spielberg, man. That's freaking yeah. huge. Well, and to, you know, again, without getting too off topic to, to talk about the music side of that show, um, you know, and just how the pandemic has affected that, I'll let Rob talk about how they're sort of struggling to get that to work on schedule. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of the, one of the sort of classic features of, you know, Warner Brothers animation going back to Looney Tunes and all that stuff is, you know, they had, they had an orchestra and they recorded music for those cartoons, you know, all the Carl Stalling and stuff like that. And, mm. You know, these these days, there's not a lot of live. And, and that room at Warner Brothers is considered one of the best orchestral rooms here in town. Yeah, it's yeah. either that or, or a blue blue wave audio. I mean, and, and really, it's, and it's these the days, thing because the the whole idea of recording a live orchestra for cartoons has you know long since gone by the wayside. But when we started Animaniacs, one of the things that, that Steven Spielberg you know mandated basically was that we're going to go back and do a live orchestra and they went back and got the composers from the original series back in the 90s and they're composing again 
So uh, wow. they're doing a lot of work recording that show, which, of course, during a pandemic, <laughs> makes things incredibly right. Because we were actually halfway through an episode recording the orchestra when all this came down. So uh, the composers, that was that was a stumbling block at, at one point, trying to figure out how they were going to work. So, down. and now in revisions are, you know, are a big problem as well. I mean, you know, it was before, like, literally everything else that we've done for years and years and years has always been, you know, sampled, you know, library music, uh, you know, like, you know, drawing from a sample library to, to create the, the score with maybe some, you know, soloists or other, you know, live instrumentation just to sort of enhance it. Um, but yeah, with the Animaniac score being a full live orchestra, uh, yeah, just, you know, whereas before revisions, if somebody decided, hey, we need to change this cue, we could literally have it in an hour on the stage or, you know, they could they could do revisions pretty quickly. But now you got to get the you got to assemble the orchestra. And, and and to that point, it's like a lot of composers uh, nowadays are editing their own music. And so yeah. mixing and mixing their own and music, mi- mixing, and mixing their, their own music. Yeah. One stop so, shop. So the, so the role of sort of the music editor or the, the scoring mixer is sort of in, in TV animation has sort of been vanishing, but with this show, it's, it's very much alive. I mean, um, that we have our composers and then it goes through a music premix and then we have an editor. And so it's like, yeah, when we need stuff, you know, kind of adjusted, it's like, we call the music editor when I call the composers and they're, they're doing their thing. And, um, but I mean, it, it makes a huge difference. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the music that we get for all of our shows is great, but man, when you hear the live orchestra hit in this room on, you know, on a, something want, like Maniacs, yeah. it was like, okay, yeah, wow. Like, you that can classic, hear, that classic, yeah. like Looney Tunes strings, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. style orchestra. It's like, yeah, there's some power so, behind that. And, and again, just having, just having sort of the, the, the original composers and, you know, we, we actually, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, ties back to the original series i won't i can't reveal too much but it's okay. it's pretty uh it's pretty awesome um and then and then awesome. you know I'll let, I'll let dj speak to it uh the other show that you mentioned is actually as jurassic world camp cretaceous it's an animated series from dreamworks and uh you know one of the big things that everybody you wanted to know is like oh are we going to get to hear all the john williams <laughs> themes in the series and, uh, and you know the answer is Yes. Yeah. I mean, there it's, it's not John Williams writing the music day to day, but it's, um, but they have another composer who's, you know, who's doing his own original stuff. And then, you know, when it calls for one of the classic melodies, uh, it's in there. And so it's, uh, wow. it's, it's, you know, as, as someone who that you know, counts the original movie as one of his favorite films, like just, just pushing, pushing up the fader to get that, that score to swell, you know, when you hear that, that uh. classic Jurassic Park, uh, it's, it's very, it's very satisfying. Yeah. It's awesome. That's it so cool. You, it gives you the chill that you want to, you want to hear for something like that. You know? That nostalgia too, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. Cause you know, again, there's another franchise that's been around for, you know, for, for 20, 30 years or whatever it is at this point. I mean, it's, you know, it's going strong. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's amazing. You know, it's funny, you know, you talk about composers bringing in, sourced music from previous brand to show style situations. Um, you know, what are you finding guys with like music supervisors that you work with in general? Like you said, composers are mixing a lot of their own music and things of that nature. And I know some composers will outsource stuff either bought or created from original content. You know, are you finding that the, the supervisor, the show, the network is leaning more towards cheaper solutions to place music in their shows essentially? It's a great question. That was my what I was thinking. <laughs> I was because I don't know, that's the great question. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it just it depends. I think it just depends on the show and the sensibilities creatively what they're going for. Um, on Jurassic Park, the the music supervision department at DreamWorks is very involved. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's you know because they spend they're spending a lot of money to license you know the John Williams material for them to use or if there's just a lot of eyes on it from top to bottom I know Spielberg was also very involved with the with the with the Camp Cretaceous show um you know not quite as much as Animaniacs but you know just watching previews and things and, and weighing in here and there um you know then we've got you know that you know we did it we did a show uh, you know most of this year and last year uh called Kipo and the age of the wonder beast also for dreamworks and it had a really eclectic mix of, of music it had some it had a lot of original score 
Um, but then it also had, uh, you know, licensed needle drop music, um, you know, that actually they used very effectively, you know, you know, for each, for, for whenever they did it. I don't think it was necessarily a, you know, an issue of like, you know, trying to get out of paying the composer less money, but I think it was, it, 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 I think it ended up being a great forum because I think they just like the season two is going to premiere in a couple of weeks and they just put out like, uh, like a season two compilation of music from the show. Um, and I think it's actually become like a great sort of forum for, you know, maybe more obscure or indie artists to get their stuff, you know, that was, sort of that was, that was my next question was like, how do you find, you know, where are they finding the new talent? Because I mean, as composers get older and more expensive, I'm sure they're looking for cheap, cheaper solutions in a lot of those situations. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, like you said, I mean, the, the pandemic is definitely exposing this and that, you know, everybody's working from home there is probably going to be a chance that the studios might go, Hey, we can save a lot of money this way by keeping actors at home and not having to spend for money for recording studio time. I don't think that's necessarily going to affect us because I think the, the creators, the producers, and the directors are still pushing for the collaborative experience Efforts. of being yeah. here. Mm -hmm. that. But I can see, but as you know, in music, it's been the same thing for many, many years now oh. that, you know, it's somebody in their garage or somebody in their bedroom who are. I, I, I just, work. I just literally the past three weeks, I scored a Coca-Cola commercial from yeah. this computer. <laughs> I'm talking to you from with a focus, right? Scarlet. And it got picked up. Yeah. I mean, so, so you, know. <laughs> you know, there's some people who, you know, who you, you know, like, like in your case, do really have the experience and they know what they're doing and they yeah. with, with very limited tools or in a, in a, in a limited environment can create something just as good. But then you've also got, you know, everybody at home with their garage band, who's, you know, also sort of flooding the market with that stuff. Um, so I guess in the same respect, yeah, you've got a lot of composers who, you know, are doing, are doing their thing as well. And most, as we know, most composers already work from home to begin with. They all have their own home studios oh, yeah. and setups and all that. And it's usually very elaborate, you know, um, and uh, yeah, I guess as far as like where they're finding, you know, more indie artists or, you know, some of these more obscure, you know, songs and, and sort of, you know, I, you know, sort of musical ideas. I, I honestly don't know. I don't really have much experience in, in how they find that stuff. Um, well, let's kind of talk about your experience as a director. I mean, you've directed a few feature films yourself. I know that for a fact. Yeah, one. one. Okay, one. one. <laughs> um, which I, I was at the premiere. So that's, that's the one I can, I can, I can point North to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, know. no, no problem. It was, it was a great experience. <laughs> Very well shot. And great movie. Um, if I can remember the title, sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I that's thought, right. I'm going to do the shameless plug really quick. Cause I was talking yeah. to a friend. About do it. And, uh, for, for years it was, it was free on prime for streaming. And then really talking to a friend of mine about it, because he's getting ready to shoot his own independent movie. And, uh, and he's like, oh, where can I see it? And I said, oh, it's on Amazon. And he dialed it up and it's gone. So <laughs> I guess. Oh, I, guess, I was just going to go on Amazon and look. Yeah. Um, oh. I don't know. Demand that they return it or something. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> bring back. Yeah, it was a good experience, experience, you know. Uh, but I mean, from your experience, I mean, kind of putting that together, I mean, you were working on a very low budget when you were doing that film. And you know, I feel like the last thing that gets talked about is the music budget, you know, or it's the smallest thing in the actual overall encompassing budget of the whole entire deal. Yeah, I mean, right, you know, right from the beginning of that movie, I knew, because it's about a kid who discovers he's a superhero. It's very, you know, sort of Superman, Harry Potter. It's, you know, it's all that sort of classic stuff that we all sort of grew up with. And, and, uh, and so I wanted it to have that classic you know, full orchestra score. I wanted it to evoke that, you know, the, the John Williams or the Batman or the, you know, any of that kind of, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so right from the start, I knew that I was going to have to set aside money for that. And I wanted, you know, I did want to have live, you know, musicians, because again, I knew that, you know, there was a huge value in that. Um, I ended up meeting a great composer named Chris Carter, who has done actually a lot of, we've actually worked with him a bunch of times over the years uh, on a lot of the stuff we've done for Warner Brothers. Um, and I met him through a friend and he saw the movie and agreed to do the score. And he's like, well, how much money do you have? And I said, well, what do we, what do we need? Like, what's, you know, if we want to do this. And, and so we agreed to set aside a certain amount of, of money and it was in, it was thousands. It wasn't a lot, but it was thousands of dollars. And, and he, he agreed. And, and I mean, it's, it's actually incredibly wonderful that he did this, but for him, he was like, I don't need to take a fee to write this music. He's like, I'm, I'm willing to do it because I like the project and I want to get my music out there. And, but he's like, let's take all this money and 
like hire as many musicians as we can to do sure. it live. Yeah. And so what we ended up doing is, is at the, at the studio that we're, we're all talking about that we all sort of started at, um, they had a, they had a pretty decent, uh, tracking room. And so mm-hmm. thankfully they, they, they allowed me to use it. It was, free. it was T-Bone Burnett's tracking room at one point. There's a lot of classic <laughs> stuff done in that studio. Um, yeah. So, I mean, they, you know, thankfully the owners of the studio there allowed me to use it, use the, use the place for free for two, for two, I think we did like two nights of recording or something. And, and we basically hired a, a huge string section. We like, we, we just decided that, you know, having the live strings was going to provide the most bang for our buck. And, uh, and Chris conducted the orchestra. Um, you know, we got a great recording of it. The, the engineer did a lot of research since he wasn't, you know, he wasn't uh, actually like a, you know, a scoring engineer per se by trade. He kind of did a lot of research into how they sort of do that stuff. And, and I was like, well, this is, you know, if it doesn't come out perfect, it's fine. Like we're all sort of like, you know, getting a, a great experience out of it. And right. ultimately we got, you know, we got a, a, a wonderfully written score with some great melodies to it. And, mm. uh, and the experience of recording, it was great. And then it was all backed up with, with samples and synths and, uh, you know, and it, I think, you know, I'm happy with it. It turned out great. So that was my next question. Um, so when you have live musicians, I think nothing compares to that. Just, just even the experience, right. And the chemistry and the work chemistry. Um, is it possible, like you said, to, you know, those plugins that replicate certain instruments to just like literally take Ableton mic, right. Like an Ableton and just do the whole score on that and, and just be able to get just as good as quality. Um, from that at like, you know, half the price when you're talking the economics of uh, making that, is that yeah. something that is possible? It seems like it could be, but it's, it's not, it's the, on your, it, it hinders on your, the way you work with the, you know, that, the hands-on working experience, like it's a virtual thing too. So it, is that something heard, that, I mean, I've heard, you know, wonderfully recorded and digital um samples and things Sorry, of that nature. Um, sure. it's uh you know it's great there are certain in- parts of an orchestra strings being the main focus to me that it's really hard to rep- uh, replicate a live string which is why when he did his score he he opted for the live string orchestra just <laughs> just because of the nature of the bowed instrument and, and those kinds of things um it's not that you can't get great samples um like i said when we had to sort of mix and match the the animaniac score it they did the, the, they did an amazing job it was it was almost transparent but i think there's you know it's it's the difference between you know recording a line of adr in a dead studio room and recording it with, with a, in a place that has a little bit of life to it it's like it's really hard to you can take yeah. a plug in and take a really dead recorded line and make it feel like it's in a hall or, or something but you know it's, it's kind of the idea of same reason why we were when we, when we record bands and stuff, you know, and we're doing an ensemble recording, we're in a tracking room. It's not like a, a four by four box to just give it a gotcha. little. Yeah. So makes complete sense. And, and, and full transparency guys, um, uh, zoom has, did, have, has done this update thing where it's like, you have to, up, it's like the 5.5, uh, version of it. And for some reason I did it yesterday with Mike and it's not working. So my mic quality isn't as good as it really, I really want it to be. Um, which is kind of like embarrassing because you guys are so Dude, all it's, about it's like you're day. not wearing a cocktail dress to the party, bro. Like, it, it literally is on. like that. Like, we're it's, we're like, trying, I have this you're awesome throwing three life. engineers. Like, you really uh, going to do this? And I, I'm literally not <laughs> floating up here. And I'm sitting here talking into a microphone. Like, it's working. And it's, it's just not. And it's hey, so man. much better when the quality's on, too. It's like well, giving hey, a I mean, bodybuilder yeah. steroids. You don't send it's, your girlfriend to a not like It's not like we're set up with fancy mics on our end, either. I mean, you know, most of our stuff is is set up for, you know, remote reviews through our system. So we're just kind of on a device right now. So well. We'll take that and post, you know, Mike will do something very cool with it. He's got some stuff that he uses to make the quality yeah, better. Yeah. Too. By the so way, like, s- side note, my lot, I, I blew out my logic setup a little bit. And so I got a bunch of free stuff from waves. Hey, Greg, you know what I love about coffee? That, Mike? I loved rocked beverage.com and I especially love their 33 and a third P Kings road dog, dark roast blend. It's just what you need to pick you up in the morning and maybe put you down at night if you drink it after dinner. Where Everyone you- should have a pound of this in their freaking cupboard. I'm telling you what, we drink it on the show. We've had it since the beginning of the quarantine. Go to rockeddbeverage.com and enter the code METAL1. Nice. 
SSLG plugin. Which, which is pretty sweet because you were going to use that for this. Changes everything. Yeah, you. I mean, yeah. Mike looks like he's like ready to go on air at K Rock or, or something <laughs> like that. This yeah. is Striker. Striker. Well, this this setup is awesome, man. It's just like you know, I just don't know what happened. But yeah, regardless, we'll we'll take care of that. But yeah, I just know you guys are so good at what you do. I just full transparency. So you're like, why is this kid talking on a mic and the quality is not as good as Mike's right now? <laughs> hey, why, is you know he has a, why does he have an SM7 next to his head? And it doesn't sound like an SM7. It's a great mic too, man. It's a great so, mic. You know, you gotta. Uh, these days, you gotta do what you gotta do, right? Because right. I, you know, I mix. It's I, a coronavirus, man. Anything goes. Anything goes. <laughs> I mix it oh, obviously, right? <laughs> I mix a show for uh, coronavirus rules. Anything goes. <laughs> I mix a show for uh, CNBC called The Prophet with Marcus Lemonis. I love, and, I love that show. And I've been I doing it all the time. I, I've been doing it for about four seasons now, and uh, you know, we were right in the middle of 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 you know getting through a bunch of what they call inside looks when all of this when all this kind of went down and. You know, the main thing is, is that, uh, you know, Marcus and some of his guests are sitting there discussing an old show and they're talking about it and they're like, well, we can't shoot it. <laughs> so, so, I mean, they literally, we had him on, on Skype slash zoom, whatever. And I mean, he was recording just like you like this on a, on a network show, like talking. And they're basically like this, we got him a mic. He did a really good job getting it all set up. Like, and you know, but it, it, it was what it was. It was Skype or whatever. I think it was Skype. rolling with it. Right. And so, you know, I mean, he had a microphone, but I mean, it was subject to the internet quality. It was subject yeah. to whoever we were talking to. So it's like, you know, I went through and, you know, uh, I went through and, and, and did as much as I could to, to doctor up all the Skype footage to make him sound as good as possible. And we went to air that way and everybody still watched. And <laughs> so it's like, I love, it's not, I love that show, by the way. Know, I love it. It's my favorite. You know, it's one of my favorite shows. Show. Seriously. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, yeah. It's like I never would have dreamed five years ago that we would be that I would be mixing Skype audio on a network TV show. Like <laughs> but, <laughs> and, you know, and, and it just yeah, it just it just sort of begs the question of like, you know, yeah, like a lot of the music industry has moved into people's homes or their garages. Like, are voiceover artists going to move into you know their home studios? Like, are you know, at what point, as we all know, because it's, you know, you know, you could argue that over the last couple of decades, you know, like quality of all this kind of stuff has been steadily going down. Um, the at, saturation, at what, right. I mean, yeah, I, I, I had the complaint when we were at Oracle and I used to tell our buddy Derek Swanson all the time when we were in the machine room, like, get ready, dude. What just happened to me in the music business where thing with a, that pie that you could eat from and there was a lot of it got smaller and smaller. Like, get ready. Like it's, it's you're gonna have to like, be more creative. Yeah. I mean, you could say it, 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 it essentially mirrors sort of the state of the economy in this country, you know, in that the middle class is more or less disappearing without getting into politics. Like the, the middle class. No, right, I mean, dude, my day job is a financial advisor. Trust me. I know. And, you know, you're, you're either about. getting, you're either getting the hundreds of millions of dollars that the major studios are spending where they're still essentially doing Hollywood production the way they've done it for decades, or you're getting, you know, all the people down at the bottom who have to now, you know, mix their show in their, in their spare bedroom, you know, and, 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 and you just have to, you have to say to yourself at like, at what point, you know, does the, does the consumer say like, I won't put up with this anymore. Like the, you know, cause we're already seeing a resurgence in, in records. I mean, right. like in, in, in you know, yeah, I mean, there's, vi there's vinyl plants in Nashville that are running 24 hours a freaking day and they keep opening buildings to sell them. Yeah. And that kind so, of brings, that kind of brings me to my next question is like, you know, entertainment in general, and I think you're kind of touching on it already. You yeah. know, we're seeing movie theaters holding on by a thread. We see the surge of different, you know, whatever the new, um, you know, streaming platform is this week, um, whether it's HBO Max or something else. Um, you know, where do you guys, you know, how do you guys see that affecting you as business people, as client, you know, as, 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 you know, workers, you know, in, in the career? Yeah, your career. I mean, how do you see that? You know, does it scare you? Does it not? It's, you know, I think from, uh, I, I hope, I hope movie theaters don't disappear. I mean, I that's either. already been, that's already been a problem again. Yeah. You know, everybody laments over the last 30, 40 years that, you know, AMC, AM, you know, basically movie theaters are now essentially AMC, Regal, Edwards, Arclight here in Los Angeles and some other places. 
like the 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 big old classic movie theaters are essentially gone you know the the Grauman's the the Egyptian the you know those kinds of places and then the small like sort of little you know we, you know I, I I grew up going to movie theaters in the mall I mean yeah, it's you know I'm same. sure they were terrible but that's like that's now my nostalgia my memory of of experiencing so many movies was at the mall the indoor mall theater or yep. you know at the dollar theater on, on the corner and, uh, you know, and I, you know, I mean, like people like Quentin Tarantino are huge sort of advocates of keeping that stuff going. Um, but yeah, I mean, I hope that this isn't sort of the nail in the coffin where, you know, you know, Amazon buys out AMC and then everything now is streaming at the same time that it's in the theater and people are, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and, and to your, and to your point about the Amazon thing, I know Lemily, which is a pretty small theater chain here in, in Los Angeles and was really known as an independent uh, theater shame for a long time and started showing big blockbuster films over time. I know they have like a streaming service online for new movies that are coming out right now. Mm-hmm. So I mean, yeah. how, you know, is that the future? You know, it's like, it's very, very interesting to me. <clears throat> well, I mean, you know, for us, I mean, being that a lot of our stuff is primarily TV focused. I mean, the, obviously the advent of right. streaming has created a lot of work for us. I mean, I think like 90% of what we work on is streaming right now. Wow. I mean, it, yeah, sort of that's huge. Be, to DJ's point about the sort of quote unquote disappearing middle class, I can see I can see something like that with with theaters in that yeah you know, a lot of you know the the days of like I'm gonna pop over on my lunch hour and go to the dollar theater and watch something is probably gonna be gone, but I want to go watch Avengers Endgame in a gigantic theater and make a huge experience out of it. I'm probably going to pay more money to go to those kind of movies in yeah. a theater, but I'll probably be going less to go see you know a romantic comedy or you right. Know, Right. Or something that, that I can watch on a really nice thing at home, which so I can see sort of that gap dividing where you know movies become more of an event, you know, like going to a theater. You're gonna pay like thirty, thirty-five dollars yeah. for a, a premium movie theater experience, the yeah. IMAX, so, the large format, yeah. the, the high yeah. breaking seats, and all that kind of stuff. Which is, you know, I mean, <laughs> yes, yeah, as, as far as as far as affecting the business goes, I mean, we've actually been lucky in that a, a couple of the things that we've mixed for Warner Brothers have actually had theatrical release, like just a limited theatrical release, which is fun to see, you know. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's necessarily going to impact, impact us too much. We'll kind of sort of wait and see what happens. But yeah, just sort of lamenting the, the larger scope of the business. It's like, you know, again, like trying to get people at home to appreciate this is what a vinyl album sounds like compared to the MP3 you just downloaded from from iTunes. This right. is what, this is what, uh, you know, Avengers or whatever, you know, some either big blockbuster or some incredible, you know, or whatever, movie. whatever the, the next, right. you know, picture movie, is gonna right. be. great music, you know, it, this, it should be, it should be seen and appreciated in a movie theater with an audience. I mean, really, I think that's the most important thing is with an audience, you know? Yeah. You know, just kind of without going off on a tangent, like for growing up, you know, as star Wars is one of my favorite films. Uh. Um, I, for years I, I, and years I saw and years. it in 77 when I was four or five years old in the, okay, so I, I so, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I don't remember seeing it for the first time. I probably saw it on video. I do remember seeing empire strikes back. I would have been three or four. Yeah. Um, but for, for years and years and years leading up to 97, when they re-released the special editions, star Wars for me had always been a VHS home video alone in my room because nobody else <laughs> understood this weird thing that I was watching and maybe yep. I could get a friend or two to watch it with me but it was always this solitary private personal experience and then I watched it, it for the first time in 97 you know in a theater with a whole crowd of people with all the screaming and the cheering and the clapping and the you know and I was like whoa wait wait whoa everybody calm down like stop you're, you're <laughs> like this is not how this is supposed to be. And then you realize like, Oh no, sir, no, sir, is, sir. This is, this is how it's supposed to be. You know, yeah. this, yeah. this is just as much part of the experience, you know, as the movie itself. And so, you know, whether it's a comedy or a drama or, you know, I, I mean, any of that stuff, it has to be experienced with an audience and yeah. you don't get, you don't get that same, you don't get that same sort of, you know, like hypnotic dreamlike state at home watching it on TV. And I know, you know, bringing up Spielberg, he's been sort of a, uh, I was going to say he's very big proponent of the big theater because he's like, you can't get the same experience on an iPhone that you get or an iPad that you get. And in- yeah, I mean, he's been a vocal, vocal proponent of, you know, making sure that if you want to be Oscar eligible, it has to have been released in a theater. And I, you know, he's kind of that fighting against sense. like Netflix and some of the streaming services that are releasing their stuff simultaneously or only on Netflix. And again, so the pandemic, we'll kind of see what happens. Is the Academy going to open up? I think they already did open up rules to say like streaming is 
going to well, be haven't there been a few netflix films that have won oscars at this point i, I mean i don't oh, follow yeah. the oscars Roma, as much. um yeah i mean there's yeah there's so i mean it's here. <laughs> yeah, it's here it's here here's here's what i'm thinking do you guys you know there's this nostalgia and there's this um push to have the old cinematic experience especially when with the sound uh you know that you get when you're in a theater the experience all that however it's already happening right now and you guys are on the off the forefront right you're on the forefront of knowing where okay we're gonna you're right where it's at streaming so you you kind of you're already there luckily you don't really have to worry as much as the next person that doesn't know about getting into streaming but for all our listeners out there and our viewers they're not gonna they're probably not even at close to that point to even have the the uh the opportunity to 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 be where you are so to speak to the let's just say an up and coming um composer that wants to you know yeah. put his stuff up there out there and get it to the right people um but he only is um uh he only has so much with him he has his home studio you know those are the guys that we're, we're going to be listening to this and those are the people that are going to want to say you know see that you guys have a very very um you know effective career in what you're doing by doing what you're doing but they're going to be able to do it from home so how, what can you what kind of advice could you give somebody like that that's you know really just want, aspiring to do what you do um without you know having to overwhelm them with you know they have to do this that and the other thing to make it so perfect you know so that someday you just got to jump with both feet in right yeah i i think so i mean um you know, there's, uh, there's that part of it where it's like, you know, you should, you know, you should obviously, you know, follow, follow your heart for, for lack of a better sort of bit of advice. I, I think if you, I think if you do, if you do really good work, it will eventually get noticed. I think, you know, it's people will, people recognize good quality, creative work at the yep. end of the day, you can put aside all the sort of you know, you know, my uncle got me a job at Universal or my, you know, so-and-so, whatever, you know, that only gets you sort of in the door. That gets your foot Mm -hmm. in the door. After that, if you don't perform, you're not going to be around for a while. And, and I think, you know, you know, you you could say, oh, well, it's like, how do I, how do I get noticed? You know, I'm sort of like wallowing in obscurity here. Um, (laughs) You know, that's, uh, uh, you know, that applies to anybody who does any kind of creative work. Um, And it's even, it's probably going to be even tougher now that, you can't get that assistant job on a studio lot where you're in a place where you're going to meet people, you know, or, um, I don't, I don't know. It's, I think it's just a matter of like for somebody who's going to be like, it's it's amazing how the compounded effort has changed, you know, in the sense that people compounding their efforts to get to the next level, the next rung of the job to the next thing, you know, again, just like the middle class, it's like, there's a bunch of rungs to the ladder and then there's like this huge gap. Yeah. The disparaging wealth gap. Yep. And there isn't even a sign. There isn't even like a signpost that says go in this direction or try this direction. It's just, it is kind of like a, a, a great unknown. And, and, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't know how things have changed in the last 20 years, but I, you know, I don't know if it's just, you know, doing short films or just working for another composer or just getting hooked up with some of those people that yeah. just, again, expand your network, you know? Yeah. And it, I mean, you know, interesting. It, yeah. Go ahead, Rob. Sorry about the that. The interesting thing is, is you know, there's just like any industry, like music or, or film or whatever. There's, especially on bigger projects, there's that that desire to well, what's we want a known commodity. We want no, we want someone who's done this before and whatever. But I think with the fact that you know the sort of streaming service has sort of exploded, and everybody's looking from con- for content creators in all different walks of life, whether it be comic book people, board artists, this and that. Those people are coming up. And they're looking for something, somebody, something new, something interesting. And they're, they're looking at different options. And so I'm noticing, like, for example, on Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts and uh, this other show I worked on called Pink Malinky, where they're going out and they're finding these interesting composers and, and giving them a shot because they want that sort of, you know, it still has to lend itself to a TV show and, and show sure. accessible. But at the same time, it's like the instrumentation and some of the, the compositional techniques that they're using is just interesting and the because we have so much more content now the the studios are being are more apt to go like okay you know it, it's very creator driven um in a lot of instances where they're like okay well the showrunner the creator he's looking for this he wants this person okay we're going to go with this composer and mm-hmm. so i think there's an opportunity there for some of the new, newer composers you know 
to break into it, you know, it, like, like DJ said, if they're doing good work and it's very, it's creative and it's accessible, there's, there's, there's opportunities there for, for some people to, to get in with some of these new showrunners and creators. Um, because it's like, we don't just have channels two, four or seven and you know, whatever. Right. And you know, we're all throwing money into these five shows or whatever. I mean, now there's tons of streaming platforms and, you know, so people are taking a little bit more chances on things like, yeah, sure, on the sure, big sure. shows, you know, we, we have, we got to make sure we're taken care of, you know, but on some of the more, you know, um, you know, outside the box shows, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see some of the, the different sort of musical styles and stuff that we're getting now in an animation show. It's not all just the typical sort of, you know, techno uh you know intense you know beats or you know big electronic we're, yeah we're getting a lot of mixture of some different things now on some of these shows um, I, I do know that uh um that, that at least some of the some of the major studios that we work with in animation uh and i don't know if this is true everywhere um a lot of them tend to sort of they keep a list of quote unquote approved composers and right. how you get how you get on that list i have absolutely no idea um, that, 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 was, that was leading to a question yeah to get on that list you need to do what or you yeah I, but, right. and i know a lot of times like what happens is is if there's a if there's a showrunner or a producer who is like okay hey we're at the point where we need to decide on a composer if they don't have if they don't have a prior relationship with somebody or they don't have any ideas i think the studios generally just put a whole they put this list in front of them they go here's all their samples um, listen to all this stuff. And, and sometimes I think they even do like blind listening tests where they'll have, they'll, maybe they'll narrow the list down to a, a handful of composers. They'll have them do samples, you know, to a scene or the animatic. And then mm -hmm. without kind of saying, like, Hey, kind of like is, a spec, you mean? Yeah. Like, I think, you know, instead of, you know, then, and then everybody just sort of like a committee, they all just kind of sit there and they listen to each one without knowing who's, is, you know, whose sample is whose. And they all just kind of vote. And I mean, it's, 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 it's not ideal that they sort of make these choices by committee. It's a, you know, nobody wants to make any creative choices by committee. Um, yeah. But nobody's biased so that, either. Right. So it's like, you know, it's like, it's fair, fair game. So if your stuff stands the test of the time and yeah. it's in front of that committee, nobody's going to know who for somebody else, unless there's some inside Intel that I don't know about. Um, but that's, that seems like a fair game. I mean, if, you know, just to, just to keep everything aside and make it the most organic it could possibly be, be like, okay, I like that. Do you guys like that? Okay. Do you know that yeah. person who did that or do you just like it because yeah, you like it, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and yeah, how to, how to get on that list. I, I honestly, I don't know. Unfortunately, I don't know if it's a matter of like, you know, calling, who you, know? Uh, you know, post-production supervisors or, or heads of post-production at, at the studio. Oh, here's or, a question. Here's a question, my man. Um, who's the person, the title of the person that, that goes to that vetting process generally, is it the, What's the like that title of that person? Oh, What's it called? I would think. Is that the showrunner? If I went on LinkedIn and targeted, you know, studios, um, you know, who are you targeting? Like, you know, because like that, that's like a prospect thing. I know it goes a little outside of your box here, but like if you're, if I was like a composer that wanted to get my stuff out there to the right people, I would think LinkedIn would be a really good place to find, you know, certain executives, and you could target those executives, and then you could send them little sample clips of your stuff and. And kind of start from that there because if you don't have the channel like you guys go into the studio you do the intern thing you work your way up right well, what other alternative channels are there to get in there so just just kind of spitballing here but just you know what yeah who, I mean, who would you target i mean you know the executives at the studios are usually the ones that i think that are putting that list in front of them but i think the the content creators and the showrunners are the people that are ultimately if if you know they're the ones that are going to try to push for new talent if if you know if so they like something. I mean, that's why some of the, you know, um, some of the, you know, showrunners and creators that have context to certain composers or artists, you know, that, you know, maybe they were in a band or they saw them or they, they listened. Right. They, they come up and they go, Hey, I really want so-and-so to do this. Um, and they push for it. And if they went out, then now all of a sudden that person might be then put on that list going forward. You know, so I, I, I don't Makes know. Sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, pretty much everybody at least in animation because that's mostly the people we deal with they will all right. tell you whether you want to be like a storyboard artist or write for animation or any of that kind of anything creative they'll tell you it's impossible to go through regular channels to get anything done i mean you can't like you know you can't just call the front desk at nickelodeon and, and right. expect <laughs> you know, it's, it's unfortunate you know. um, well it depends how bold you are and then you get yeah. kicked out three times 
Like, yeah, Yo, uh, uh, SpongeBob's office, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can, can, I, you can try. Office? You can try all sorts of like, you know, crazy tricks. And I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a thousand stories of people doing crazy things and getting noticed. Um, I mean, you know, I get you. I get you. One, one, I get what you're saying. Yeah. It one easy sense. way is, is to talk to people like us. I mean, I've had, you right. know, I've had other composers that I've worked with on other shows who don't have an inroad at some place like maybe like Nickelodeon per se. And they would say like, Hey, I've never, I've, I've done a bunch of stuff for DreamWorks, but I've never done a Nickelodeon show. Like who can I talk to over there? And it, you know, I have the contact, we have the contacts that we can easily just send a quick email and say, Hey, you know, this is Check a guy and, and here's his credits. And, and that's that. I mean, for somebody who's starting out again, it's just, it's, it's like climbing a mountain. I totally understand that. Um, and again, maybe it's, maybe it is getting creative by hooking up with these people through Instagram or Facebook or especially, I mean, especially for, for animation, Instagram is huge because I mean, they're all artists. They're, they're, mm-hmm. all, yeah. they're all, their artwork is all over Instagram. And so I think maybe, you know, connecting with them through that and just kind of, you know, without being creepy or, or, you know, yep. yeah. a, a restraining <laughs> order taken out against you, um, you know, just, There's just the answer, to, you know, There's try the to try answer. to strike up a relationship. You don't, and, you don't want to be on that list. Yeah. yeah. That's not, then that you're, list. then you're gone. Then you're never going to, then never going <laughs> to know who you are not to work yeah. with you. It's like you're known in the industry. Oh, I am. Yeah. Not in a bad way. Yeah. Not good. Yeah. around fast. You know, if you're if you're bold enough to try to you know cold call you know executives and other people like that, I think you know in in television um, the people who excuse me the people who really make all the decisions are the showrunner. The showrunner is usually a producer or an executive producer. Um, the directors, you know, in animation, and sometimes there's one, a lot of times there's two. Uh, they're they don't really have the same sort of position or stature that they do in feature films. You know, it's, it's much more gotcha. of a produced medium in television. So those are the people you want to go after, but then also, you know, um, yeah, I don't know if like, you know, sort of that, the head of the head of post-production at a studio, you know, might be a, a place to start. Um, a, again, it's, it's kind of nebulous and I'm sorry, I don't have a more, no, 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 you know no, what? No, That's, the That's, That's the point. That's the point, man. It's like, like, need it's to like figure it out. yeah, exactly. Just see what you <laughs> think, you know, based off I mean, of what we're, yeah. Yeah, you know, to talk about, okay. you know, to talk about my own experience. I mean, I, I grew up in, in, in Illinois. I moved out here to go to school after school. I was like wandering aimless throughout this town, trying to figure out what to do with myself. And again, not having any, you know, uh, you know, friend or family relationships to, you know, to exploit in that respect. I just went out there and I was pounding the pavement and, you know, I mean, I, I think I had like $29 to my name at one point and I was like, I got to get a job, you know, and I sent out, wow. Uh, I sent out a hundred resumes and I got two phone calls back out of a hundred resumes. One of them was for a company in Pasadena and they were actually like offering me, it was, I mean, you could tell they were, they were a very small operation. They were kind of, I don't want to say like on their way out, but they were seemed like they were going down and, uh, and they were like prepared to offer me like to be the head of their, their post audio department. I literally was like a year out of school. And then the other company that called me was the company that we all ended up working for. And they just, they needed somebody as an intern. And I just said, all right, well, I mean, I'll do this. I just, I need work, you know? Right. And, and then from there it was, it, it just explodes. You know, it's like, you just, you put in your time in that sort of a position and it, it just, you know, you play your cards right and you do good work. I think again, the, yeah. the, the common Quality. denominator is, is you do good work and you treat everybody you work with like incredibly well and everybody after after just a short amount of time it happens really fast people go i want to work with that guy mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. that's all it comes down to yep. that's great information it's great it's great if value right there. if you're consistently doing good work you never know who it's going to resonate with you know at the mm-hmm. right time. i mean yeah one of the more fascinating music stories in in, in uh in animation i i, I mix uh teen titans go for warner brothers and the way they handle their music is very different like it's all, it's almost all needle drop music from, you know, from, uh, licensed libraries and things like that, like Telepix. And, but, but the directors go through and sort of choose that stuff and sort of quote unquote score their episode. Mm-hmm. But at times, uh, you know, uh, Peter Michael and, uh, and, and a composer friend of his, Jared, they, they'll write songs for the shows based off the Telepix tracks. And then they'll go back to Telepix and they'll sort of, you know, rework new tracks for the show that way and, and drop them in. Um, Interesting. We ended up basically the show ended up basically creating a band that wasn't a band. Like uh, <laughs> you know, they, had a, they had an episode where they put a they put a they put one of those tracks from one of those libraries in there, 
I think it was called like 80 something or other. And it was called The Night Begins to Shine. And it was like, all of a sudden, everybody blew up. I'm like, what the heck is that track? And it was like three musicians who just kind of, again, worked for hire, wrote some tracks for a library thing. And like, it's turned into this whole thing where it's like, we've, ha- we've done multi-part episodes called The Night Begins to Shine. They actually formed a real band. They have wrote new music for the show now. Oh, like, so it and then, inspires new opportunities. Yeah. And then, you know. Uh, it's amazing. You know, P. Michael, who's the who's the showrunner right now, uh, you know, his, like again, he's worked on songs where he's written like hip hop songs with his friend Jared. And then mm-hmm. when they did the Teen Titans movie uh, a couple summers ago, like Jared ended up being the composer for the whole movie. So he, you know, he had never scored a film before, but he was he was been working on the show. He's friends with Pete. They got together. They were doing great 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 work. And Warner Brothers were like, yeah, let him score the whole let him score the movie. So it's like. Now he's got a, he's got a feature film score under on yeah, his credit list. Exactly. Yeah. And then and, yeah, and then in the series we we've got this band called DER that was that wasn't even it was a fictional band, but now now it's a real band and like they've <laughs> they've written mul- multiple songs for the show going forward just because, you know, they got their music out there. It was in a library at one point. Somebody picked it and then everybody went crazy for it. So it's like they wrote, they wrote something good and like boom, boom. So. What does that tell us then? That, that's thank you for sharing that. Uh, both of you have really good aspects of of, of what we're you know looking for. Um, just naturally, it's just it's a byproduct of what you're doing, you're experiencing, and who you know. So I guess to the the listener and the viewer, like there you go, there it is. Like you know, it's one guy. You know, teleflex through teleflex. Like anything can happen. Just keep, keep putting putting out good content. Um, keep pushing, you know, maybe, maybe include, you know, based off of what's going on right now, you can't really go into a studio and try to be an yeah. intern right now, but, uh, do everything you can like, and, and keep putting out that content. That's an amazing story, by the way, just from Teleflix, how a band was created. And now that led to all these other opportunities. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, again, it's just, again, talking about cheaper solutions they they weren't going with a composer on that show because they were trying to, it was funny because when the show started, it was kind of, you know, very you know, keep it down and dirty and we're going to do this and it's going to be a funny show. And it's turned into this massive, you know, hit show for Cartoon Network. And, you know, so then they've just continued to do things the way they've always done them. And, you know, I mean, I do, I do a ton of, uh, you know, kind of editing and stuff on the stage and we sit there and talk about how we're going to do music, but yeah, we come across these tracks. And like I said, you know, they ended up taking some old tracks and, and, and making some new stuff, but, but the, the band, right. The three guys that make up BER, I mean, they just wrote, they, they just came together. The first episode was called 40, 40, 20, based on how much percentage of the song they wrote for this thing. <laughs> and, and so it was like, you know, the, the three guys wrote this the song. songwriter split. That's awesome. Library. And, and That's awesome. It was only on screen for like a short amount of time when it first <laughs> played. And then they, then they made the 40, 40, 20 episode because everybody was kept, what is that song? Like, where can we get it? And like, they're like, it's just a track. <laughs> so. Then it ended up gotta get them in here. <laughs> now, 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 BER is a real band, and they got stuff on iTunes, and, and just just because you know they caught lightning in a bottle. So I think you know just uh, getting getting the music out, especially if you're uh, you know it's tricky because you don't want to throw stuff out there and worry about copyright stuff and everything. But at the same time, if you do it sure. in a, in a uh, you know focused environment like where you can get your stuff out there, and these, these content creators and, and showrunners can hear it, I mean that's I think that's yeah, that's the that's sort of the new wave of of you know people putting things on SoundCloud and all that other stuff. Right. So yeah, so Teleflex <laughs> is a is a platform where you can put your your little cues on there, and then they can choose through those cues. And if you make such good cues and they're good enough, look what it can lead to. You know, just that's that's very very cool and inspiring. So sure. I kind of want to um, get one more question in and, and let you guys go because I know you guys are busy as as always with all the shows that you guys are doing, but. You know, two things like you guys have started the Rebel Sound's been in business for what a year now? How do you actually like a year and a half, probably exactly? We started in like January of 2019. So we're okay. probably, yeah, we're a year and a half in. About a year and a half in. And so, with that said, I know what it's like to run a business myself. You know, it's got to be extremely busy for you guys. I mean, how do you guys balance your regular lives with, with running the business, or is it the all consuming, you know, black hole of being in a post house? I mean, that was, uh, that's an excellent question. I mean, that was, that was one of our biggest concerns when we first started talking about doing this, because having worked at a lot of other small boutique studios like this, um, we watched a lot of other studio owners. Some of them were just businessmen. Some of them were engineers turned Mm -hmm. owners. 
And, you know, and so we watched, you know, we watched how a lot of people struggled with like, yeah, balancing that time between being in the chair and having them put their business owner hat on. Um, and I think the two of us went into this immediately being like, okay, like right in the beginning for, I don't know, three years, five years, whatever it's going to be. We, yeah, we're going to be doing double duty. I mean, this is going to consume a lot of pretty much every moment of our, of our lives in that as, as the, the sort of the two big money makers of the company, like we have to be in the chair. Like we, yeah, right. people are coming here to work with us. So we have to be the ones in the chair doing the engineering and the mixing. Um, and so, you know, as an example, like I handle all the bookkeeping and the finances, I basically dedicate either Saturday or Sunday of every week to deal with that. Like it's, you know, that's, that's the time I have set aside to just deal with that. The two of us kind of split up um, other sort of business management duties, you know, just kind of like taking things up as they come along. You know, we're just, it's constant mm-hmm. communication between the two of us. Um, but I mean, yeah, our, our ultimate game plan is, is as time goes on and we expand and we hire other engineers is to slowly, you know, and, and there's just sort of a natural, like, you know, sort of turnover as a lot of the clients that we work with kind of filter through the business and move on to other things. You know, we start getting new clients and new business in, maybe they're not going to necessarily be attached to the two of us as engineers. Maybe they want to work with the new guy we hired or one of the up and coming guys that we've, that we've trained. And, you know, over time, it'll slowly be, you know, we'll start getting out of the chair and, you know, being more, you know, business owners and business managers. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a balancing act. I mean, there's, you know, there's times when, you know, like if I'm in the mix stage all day long and I just can't deal with something, it's like, Rob's got to be like, okay, I'm on this or whatever. And then the next day we flip flop and I'm like, okay, I'll spend the morning making phone calls and you know, doing whatever needs to be done, putting out the fires, managing, you know, right. it's just, it, there's a lot of like, I mean, you know, as the joke goes, it's like you wake up in the morning and you've got this whole list of things that you're like, I'm going to do this today. And then five minutes after that, everything's on fire and you're like, all right, I just got to do damage control, you know? Right. You know, it's right. interesting because it's, you know, the other benefit that we've had is we've had about 10 plus years working together and working with a lot of the guys that we work with now that work for us. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if, yeah, our if, team has been together for a long time. If, if we had to, you know, I mean, I'm managing a ton of the projects here in terms of the editorial. If I had to start from the ground up brand new editors and, and people that I've never worked with or didn't know, that would be extremely difficult. But because I've worked with a lot of our guys for so long, like I trust them. And that's a big part of being a business owner is trust the people that are working. I trust them. Yeah. Stuff, you know that that I, I don't have to micromanage them to do um, because they're they're very skilled at what they do. And, and same thing. The two of us have worked together for a long time, so same thing. You know, we I trust that he's going to make good decisions. He trusts I'm going to make good decisions. So it's like you know, neither one of us are micromanaging everything, and I think that's allowed us to be. That's like that's a, 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 yeah, oh, dude. I mean, that's yeah. the one thing I've always seen with like a post house studio, whatever when you start micromanaging and you're not able to delegate or not able to, you know, put, put the proper job with the proper person, it kind yeah. of, the house of cards falls apart. I mean, you know, you spend, you can easily get out of school, set yourself up with, you know, you know how to work pro tools, you know how to do the job. You know, I'm going to open my own business. I'm going to do this. Um, and, and you might be good at it, but, but having the years of experience we have, mm-hmm. the clientele that we've built up, I mean, our, our reputation, our, our, our business is built on our reputation of years of doing good work. And then also having a team of people that we trust. So it's like, you know, if we had made this decision, you know, seven years ago, we, we might not have been as successful as we are now because, because we just, you know, we, we took all the necessary steps. We saw how, what, what people did in the business, what was successful, what wasn't successful, what worked, what didn't work, all the pitfalls, all, all yeah. the pitfalls. And so it's like, now there's just so much of a library built up that as things come up, see that and go, Oh, there's not a lot that we haven't seen at this point. You know, I mean, obviously the industry is changing, but we're much right. more equipped to handle it. Cause I mean, he and I've been discussing this for years of doing this and you know, we always just sort of put it on the back burner and it's like all of a sudden the, 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 the alarm one goes, okay, now it's time. We now it's time to pull the trigger. I remember when we were at our, our for, former employer, we were named nameless. Um, <laughs> uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, <laughs> You know, you guys were even talking about it back then. 
Yeah. I remember yeah. there was the, there was the talk of getting a house and putting a post yeah. office inside of it. I remember that vividly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we. And I was like, please don't go. Please don't leave me here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was. I think it was around 2008. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. When I first started working we, there, we had, uh, you know, and, and and I mean, you know, him and I were were fairly, you know, well established at the time. We weren't really doing much of the work, you know, that we are now. Uh, we were kind of do, we were doing a lot of other different stuff, but um, you know, we we were we had already started entertaining the idea where we were like, you know, it feels like things are unstable right now, and we need to add some stability to it. <laughs> Um, you know, and, you know, we talked to some of the clients and they were like, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll support you guys. And we started looking around for office space. We found like a, like just a, a, a cool, like little house, like in the middle of Burbank, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's on a major thoroughfare and it would have been kind of like a unique place to set up. It would have been, you know, real, just casual, like not, you know, a casual sort of setup, but it would have worked for the kind of the, the scale of the operation that we were, we were planning. Right. Um, and you know we were in the pro- we were we were as far as like negotiating a lease agreement, and then all of a yeah. sudden like you know the whole economy just collapsed, and we're like hmm, maybe we should not rock the boat right now. And yeah. you know we said like let's just you know let's just wait this out, and it doesn't feel like right now is the right time. And then here we are ten years later, um, and it did finally feel like the right time. And, and, and not only that, but just the experience of managing a team and you know managing a business. I mean, just to mm-hmm. have all those extra years of experience, you know, to put it, put it in terms of like a sports analogy, it's like, okay, I just got a great job as an offensive coordinator of a football team. And I did a really great job one year. And now they want me to be a head coach. It's like, well, just because I had a really good year as a coordinator doesn't mean I'm ready to be a head coach yet. But now right. seven to 10 years later, now we're ready to be head coaches because we put in the time and you know, experience. And- but, but I think respectfully for yours and my team has not been a few good years. No, right. but well, mine's, on, <laughs> mine's on the rise right now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take solace in that. <laughs> anyway, which why, guys. Which is why that's... we won't have a good season this year because my team's actually going to have a chance to be good. Hey, so I got one, one real quick closing Sorry question. About that. What would you guys like to see? Um, and we'll do it one more time. What would you guys like to see change in the uh, industry for the better? Hmm. What do you think's missing that's not happening either for engineers like yourself, composers? Like, what would you like to see that would? That would kind of I personally change? would like make the situation a, better for everybody. I would like to see a more integrated workflow between composers, sound effects editors, and dialogue editors because I feel like right now, especially because we're all working independently and solo, it feels like three parts. If there's a triangle of a, of a project being made, we're three parts of a triangle, but we rarely ever get to talk to each other and work together in terms of coming up with a cohesive, you know, creative vision. Um, we're working through the showrunner or the show creator, but sometimes it's just really good to, you know, you know, get on the have phone those relationships and have those relationships. In terms of, we, you know, we have spotting sessions for sound effects. I would love that to have the dialogue editor there and the composer there so that all three of us can talk about okay, in this moment, this is what we're going to do, you know? And because I think while it's much more difficult to arrange the, the planets to get everybody to talk, and it, it's probably a bigger headache for the studios, I think if, they, if we did move in that direction, they would see a much more focused mix, set, mix session. And we could actually like do um, much more intricate mixes and maybe get done, you know, in less time only because... Workflow. You know, you know, he's not having to, on the mix stage to having to sort out three different ideas and trying to make them all come together because we didn't get a chance to talk to everybody. Yeah. A lot of it, it, you know, again, like in any, in anything creative, the more decisions you can make earlier in the process, the better. They don't have to be sure. set in stone, but mm-hmm. if you, if there's at least there's a game plan, you've got, you've got a plan that you can diverge from later on. But I think a lot of times the prevailing wisdom today is, is like, I, I can't tell what it's going to be. We're just going to have to hear it all put together at the mix. And unfortunately, a lot of the shows that we work on, you know, because of the budgets and the schedules, we, we only get sometimes a day, a half a day, you know, to, to, to review these things. And, you know, I mean, some of these shows are, are very dense and action packed. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of sound effects. There's a lot of action. It, it just, it takes time. I mean, if I, if I were to, you know, answer that question, I would just say it'd be great to, if everything just had more time, which of course translates to more money in the budget, you know, right. um, mm-hmm. if they just allocated, you know, a little bit more time for a lot of these things. And really all it does is it just gives, 
it gives everybody in, involved the ability and the opportunity to just try things, to experiment, which I feel like there's just, there's rarely the opportunity for that to happen today. Sure. sure I mean, sure. one of the, you know, the approach that we've always taken to doing this stuff is, is we try to get it as close to finished as possible by the time you walk in the door to listen to it. So that, you know, what you're listening to, if, if we had to make the decision that it had to go to air as it is right now, it would totally be fine. Um, but now you can spend all of your mixed time playing around, experimenting, trying things, as opposed to doing damage control, as opposed to just like, I can't hear this line of dialogue here, or I think the music should swell more here. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of that that goes on in the mix, but you know, you should be able to just be sitting back and going like, what if we try this here? Or I've got an idea. I just had this idea. Like we can afford to spend a half an hour exploring something, whether it's successful or not. And that's, you know, that's the sort of the luxury that, you know, uh, a lot of the, you know, the, the, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, feature films, Hollywood blockbusters have, you know, don't get me wrong. It's all relative. Like they're just as much under the gun as we are. Um, but just having the luxury of being able to try something, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, nine times out of 10, you know, it might be the wrong idea and you go, well, we just wasted an hour doing that, but it was a worthwhile exploration. You know, maybe we yeah. end up right back where we started Added to this resolution or something. Or mm -hmm. maybe, yeah, or maybe it, it's, it, it, it spawned another idea and it took us in a, in a different direction. And I, to me, that is, that is time well spent. That is, you know, putting in a little bit amount of time and getting a huge return out of, you know, what you've invested in it. And, and, um, and to that point, it's like, yeah, the same, the same thing goes is, is to, it, it works hand in hand. If, 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 if all three sound departments of sound are, are having sort of that conversation throughout the process and it's like, you know, we're, we're working on a show called Fast and Furious Spy Racers, which is the action yep. scenes, just what you'd expect from Fast and Furious. I mean, they're insane. So it's like, um, now, now imagine everybody's working in a vacuum, a car's about to peel out and somebody's going, three, two, one, go. Right. It's like, if I know that the music is going to do this huge ramp up there, like, I'm probably going to go, I'm going to design that car to do less engine and more just the skid sound, just because I want the music, you know, we want the music. It's more, to, more implied versus the music. You know, but, you, but then you've also got to hear the person counting down. Whereas like <clears> if we've all got on the same page and it's like, okay. And, and all that is well balanced by the time it gets to him, then he might have the idea like, Oh, well, what if, what if everything just kind of goes away and we echo the voice out or something, you know, he can now start to like make a more creative decision instead of just sort yeah. of trying to pull everything apart. And, and that's the thing is like to, to that answer is like, because we don't have a lot of time, I don't have the chance to sit there with the composer and be like, you know, well, what are you going to do here? Well, what's your idea? Okay, well, I was going to do this. Like, what if we do this? You know, and mm -hmm. so that's that's the, the, the sometimes we get a little bit of it, but we don't get a chance to do a lot of that. And sure. So, sure, you sure. know, he just gets this mountain of stuff that he has to basically. He gets this giant <laughs> and he's got ching 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 ching. ching for, yeah, you know. I mean, as you know, it's like any any again anything we do, creative or artistic. You know, some people just come up with uh, 10 ideas right off the bat and sometimes it just needs to simmer a little bit, you know, and it's, it's like you need, you need to allow yourself time to work through and arrive at a, at a new and interesting idea. And, you know, a lot of times it's just like, quick, 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 hurry up and, and get it done, get it out the door, you know, so, because you got you to let the creative process, you know, run its course and awesome. within reason, of course, we can't go on forever, but it's. Yeah, it's, no, uh, no, no, of course. Well, Rob, so DJ Rob, man. Must answer. It's been a pleasure having you guys here. <laughs> pleasure. Like, Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. I learned a lot. It's been, yeah, man. The expounded knowledge has been amazing between you two both. You've always guys have always been two of my favorite engineers. So um, thank you. It's been great to have you guys on our, on our second episode and, and this, this journey that we're starting with the music combine. So appreciate you guys having here and we'll talk soon. Thanks guys. Right. Have a good, good one guys. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Take Bye. care. Right. There's a difference between perseverance and being weird. I think. Right. And, and it's a little weird because it's like, oh, maybe I'm a little weird because I I'm trying to persevere, but uh I'm not trying to be weird. Yeah, but at but, the same point, you if you if you're doing what you love, you're gonna yeah. be naturally right where you're supposed to be anyway. Like nobody's gonna really come off that way. Creepy. But I think but I think if you have the the mode or the mindset of the hustler versus the mindset of the you know creepy dude who's just socially weird or has weird energy or whatever. Yeah, like Stanley Tucci uh, from Lovely Bones. Oh, I've never seen it. Oh, boy. He's I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to have to watch it now. Oh, boy. Um, know, your know your role. Know your role, son. <laughs> yeah, uh, so...
Yeah, you're the content creator. I know you're personally attached to this a little bit more than your average corporate job, but you yeah. need to know where to stay back and and like, you know, you created this. Let somebody else field. say what they're going to say and and let them bring their expertise on where they think they could be placed and and together, yeah. you know, you could create a team of people that will work for your best benefit and be open to criticism yeah. because you're going to get it no matter what, right? Yeah, so for definitely. Well, anyway, man, awesome episode again. I love doing this with you, dude. Ditto. Love, love being in business with you, dude. So, um, Ditto. so anyway, next week, uh, episode one hundred and three, we have the world famous yeah. and mighty Eric Deniston, aka Eric Bloons, and we're gonna premiere the track "I Feel Alive" on the show, which drops on June nineteenth. Um, yeah, which Looking forward is to it. the same day. It's gonna coincide with the same day with the with the song release. So stay tuned for that, man. He dropped a lot of a lot of gifts of knowledge into that episode too. So I'm I'm super sure excited did. about it. Yeah. Um, yo, man. Great show again. I'll see you next week. You got it. See you next week, Mike. See you, brother. Bye. Hey Mike, you know where I like to go for my equipment? No, Greg, where? Zounds.com. That's Z Z O U N D S.com. I'm talking to you right now through the interface that I ordered. Pay while you play. It's affordable for the musician on a monthly basis. And you could pretty much get anything you need in your little heart desires. So if you have a dream to get some gear for yourself, Zounds.com. Good one. <laughs>